Welcome to our Indie Street Chat. The members of Bloodhound Picks and an occasional guest give their no BS experiences with current aspects of the industry. There's been a ton of great independent horror to come out this year, but the most fun I've had, I think, has to be from Matthew John Lawrence's Uncle Peckerhead about a punk rock band and a cannibalistic demon. Now, it is something that I recommend having with friends, sitting down, having a drink. You can laugh, and it's it's great. So I got a chance to sit down with Matt and really talk about punk rock, horror, and a slew of other topics. So enjoy. So, hi, Matt. How are you? Hey, Craig. How's it going? Good. Uh, I love the movie. I thought it was yeah, a ton of fun. I actually got to write some of the questions for um, Ginger Nuts of Horror there. Um, oh, hell yeah. Project. Cool. So, yeah. So, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, that's awesome. No problem. So there might be some repeats just for audio sake, but yeah. Yeah, no worries. No problem. Um, so I guess I just would like to get started about you know, just having you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you could have got to be a filmmaker. Yeah, so since I was a, a, a young kid or like a teenager, when I first like picked up a guitar, I've been uh, playing music and playing in bands. And when I graduated uh, college, I toured with a band. We released a record for, I'd say like probably like a year and a half following college. We had played all during college. Um, and when that ended, I had always been interested in film. Um, so I just, uh, I, I started kind of studying it on my own. And then I kind of enrolled in, in grad school and started to kind of seriously, uh, pursue filmmaking. Um, and so I'd say for like the, the better part of the, the last decade, I've been really like, I, I, I made another feature film, a super low budget, uh, super kind of like scrappy film right out of grad school. But I've been making short films and short documentaries and kind of trying to make my way in the, in the world of independent filmmaking. Could you talk a little bit about Uncle Peckerhead, the movie that we're kind of going to be discussing and what's it about? Sure. Yeah. Sure. So Uncle Peckerhead is about a, a three piece punk band that's on their first tour. And it just so happens that this band has a, a man eating monster for a roadie. And that was kind of born out of this, this concept I had had uh, where I wanted, I had wanted to pitch a, an idea for like kind of a throwback 90s sitcom um, that was about a punk band kind of living in a row house and they would get into kind of these, these conflicts or these situations week by week and they just so happened to live with this kind of hillbilly tweaker that inexplicably was like so much older than them yeah. and uh, really like you know you didn't know why he was there but he would kind of give this sage like advice that would help them to kind of solve their problem at the end of every episode so so I, I always pitched it as kind of a punk rock full house with a with a hillbilly Mr. Belvedere. Okay. Um, but that kind of morphed into like I'd always wanted to make a movie about touring from my experiences. Mm -hmm. So I, it just kind of like it, it came from like a bunch of ideas that somehow just kind of fit together, ended up fitting together nicely during the, the script writing process. It actually makes, I guess, a lot of sense for me because I mentioned it, I think, a little bit in the the written interview but kind of that there is so much in terms of the the casting and the characters there is this humor to it and this kind of almost um sitcom like characters i guess that you start to find that make that make it delightful in this way yeah and uh, i'm always i like i actually like i mean i was a tv kid growing up yeah. so i i have a fond love for like the 90s sitcom but i also i have a fond love for like uh films that have comedic films that have kind of a large cast of characters even if it's not like a large cast of main cast um but just kind of like these these one scene or these like few scene kind of characters that kind of pop in but they're so dynamic and so memorable that you know like especially with cult films like yeah. there's a kind of like there's this kind of like 
following built around these characters, like, you know, that, that may appear for only like, you know, five to 10 minutes on screen in a film. But yeah, I mean, I've always been a fan of that. So I kind of wanted to do that type of movie. And then, so what was the process like of getting this made? Oh man, it was a, it was, it was a, a bit of a slog. Um, so like we were, we were micro budget scrappy production. Um, so we, we didn't have, we knew we wouldn't have a lot of money to work with. Um, so like, I would say the film was like half self-funded, uh, coming from my wife and I, and then the other half came from like just a small handful of investors that I, I think I always make the joke, but like clearly don't care about money. Okay. Um, they just kind of like, they really liked the idea and they really kind of like, liked, like a couple of them came from this short film I had made, Larry Gundeman, and they just kind of liked the voice that they saw in that and kind of the energy they saw in that. And once I kind of pitched them on uh, Uncle Peckerheads, yeah, we had some kind of like concept or um, they kind of luckily just kind of trusted us to kind of make the movie. Um, but it was like, you know, it, it was calling on like every favor yeah. you, you could ever think of. So like everyone worked their, like every person on crew, every cast member worked their ass off probably, you know, clearly weren't making what they deserved to get paid and, and kind of worked, you know, 18 hour days and just busted their ass for the movie. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's just, it's the, the luck of meeting really great, like people that, that really kind of believe in independent filmmaking and are just absolute saints. I mean, and it really shows the passion of it, I think shows in the movie. Oh, thank you. No problem. Um, so I guess I'd, I'd love to kind of hear, as I kind of mentioned a little bit about having these characters and these, you know, everybody having their own kind of personality and um, stealing the spotlight in the way. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, like, again, that's, that's all down to luck. Like, um, the only person that I knew I wanted in it, besides, like, there there are, like, a few, actually, two of the characters that I knew I wanted in it were uh, Jeff Riddle, who plays Max in the film. He's the guitarist. Yeah. Like, we've been, fr- we've, been a, we've been friends for, like, close to a decade. He's been in some of my other films. He's this amazing musician. He's this, like, incredibly funny, charismatic, just uh, also a beautiful human to 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 hang out with uh, let alone collaborate with on stuff so I knew I wanted him in it I knew I wanted him to kind of write the music he was totally game he, he really wanted to work on a bigger project together and this this was kind of tailor made for us to kind of uh, work on the other person was uh, Shiloh who plays yeah. kind of the, the the other antagonist in the movie uh, that's that's like been my best friend for the past 15 years Ryan Conrad who actually was also our our production manager on set so he was wearing two hats whenever he was uh, acting um, and he's just like one of the funniest like most insane people I know he's one of the most brilliant like he's a P- he has a PhD okay. he's just like kind of like like just a, a an absolute kind of like amazing conversationalist and, and actor um, but he's like you know he's like a man of a thousand uh, interests so he's like really good at all this stuff um, but he, he those two I knew I wanted in it and then we just got like we just lucked out in casting in that Chet and Ruby who play uh, Judy and Mel in the film and David Littleton who plays uh, who plays Peckerhead they all uh, you know responded to our casting call Chet and Ruby came came in um david sent in a video and i mean yeah I, like it it, it it i'm sure like it, it sounds like a line but they were all my first choice and i just lucked out uh that they that they also were really into kind of uh taking on the role and it was it was amazing because really like within the second day of principal photography they were like a tight-knit group like the van in the movie is just van um in real life, the van has been used. So Jeff would drive to and from set with them in tow. So like the four of them, like, like ate together, stayed at the same place together. Um, like would, would travel together, would go get ice cream together, like during downtime. Um, and then like, they just had like their personalities just click so perfectly. And they offset had such an affection for each other, liked each other. And luckily that helped like i mean that did the work for me in that i didn't really have to kind of direct them or kind of like over explain what their relationship is or how they feel about each other they just legitimately had that affection and that kind of like camaraderie that that you would expect them to have off of that i was curious because there are 
I, I, of course, I don't want to spoil anything for anybody listening, so they should watch the movie themselves. But there are some kind of histories of Peck that are left unknown, and you know, certain elements. Are, did you kind of plan this to go further and tell a bigger story, maybe like af, you know, a sequel? Yeah, I mean, like when I initially wrote the script, I didn't have that in mind. But then when we came upon the ending of the film, or when I came upon the ending of the film during the writing process, I felt that that was the the most, uh, I don't know how to explain it. It felt that that was the ending, but then that's it's a really open-ended, uh, you know, resolution, or not a resolution, but it's a very open-ended way to, to end the film. Um, and I, I had kind of wanted to, like, I had had an idea of, of how to kind of continue it on, but if I were to continue it on within that, that one script, it would have like extended it another, like, you know, hour. Oh, okay. Um, so, so I, I kind of had in mind, uh, and I've, I've written a treatment now to kind of like follow it up of like how I would extend that, that to a sequel. Uh, so I do have a, a sequel to the film that I would die to do, um, cause it like kind of picks up or, like almost immediately seconds after where it leaves off um and it tells like a totally different story involving peck and the band no that's um yeah i was really interested in that and i mean um david who plays peck was as i even kind of talk about is he's great and, and it's you know just delight delightful in this weird way that no matter what happens you're kind of rooting for him and his portrayal yeah, I mean, and, and David, uh, like, I cannot sing David's praises enough, both as an actor um, and as a as a human being. Like, I mean, he, David's the type of person on set who's, like, one of the most professional actors I've met. Like, he can nail it in one take, like, that type of, like, magic actor. Um, he's also the person that, you know, you're on a micro-budget shoot, so, like, you know, there's there's not a lot of people on cast or crew to begin with. And, like, you know, if it's raining and we're shooting outside, he's he's with everyone, like, moving, like, you know, lights, like, helping to, to put stuff back in the van. Um, he does, he's, he's, like, the least... Actory actor, you could you could you could ever meet, um, and just as like a human being, like I still talk to him and, and chat with him like uh, like at least a couple times a week. We hang out um, via Zoom and play like games with a, a bunch of the people that that were involved in the film. So he's just like he's become such a good friend, um, and he's just like it, like I'm so glad like you and other people have noticed how much of a, a crazy talent he is. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And I mean, that actually kind of touches on um, a certain aspect of it in that, you know, for so much um, punk rock and movies, at least, are seen as, you know, they show that the one kind of classic punk rock style that, you know, as somebody who grew up on punk rock myself, you know, I know there's all these different subgenres and so on, but you really kind of touch on all these different ones and you deal with the the pretentious aspect of punk as well. And totally. Yeah, and so what was I guess the approach to dealing with your history of touring or yeah, I mean, like, I, th- I think, I, like, also as a as a kid that grew up listening to punk rock since, like, like really, like, I mean, now it's, like, since I've been, like, you know, 10 or 11 years old, I've been listening to this music, and yeah, I mean, I, and there's nothing wrong with how it's been depicted in film, in, in some films, like, yeah. like, but, but you only get, you know, the leather jacket, the safety pin, and the mohawk, um, and I feel that, like, as a kid growing up as a punk, like, certainly like there were periods when I dyed my hair but like I was in the leather jacket punk kid you know I was yeah. the like ripped up jeans and t-shirt kid mm-hmm. and it doesn't it, like it doesn't matter what ilk of punk you are um, but I really wanted to show like you know a different type of punk and how punk isn't just one kind of like homogenized aesthetic um, and how like like punk kids don't act just in one certain way um, and also, like, I, I really wanted to kind of show how, like, exclusive some 
some some of those musicians would act you know like how how like utterly pretentious and insufferable they could they could be and like not just kind of showing you know like just kind of like the typical media representation of punk whether it's like a snotty brattiness or like a too cool for schoolness um but just to kind of show kind of the 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 spectrum of how kind of this this subgenre kind of uh, or the genre kind of carries itself in like these various characters. I guess, and I know you touched on this too. Is you see yourself as what? Or are you a Judy? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the characters, um, Judy was by far the easiest to write. Um, just because uh, when I was in bands growing up, and even you know, as as a as a director slash producer on a micro budget set, like you're definitely. Uh, on, a, on a film set, it's different because, you know, you have, you know, everyone is responsible, you know, especially because like on a film, on a micro budget film set, if one person drops the ball, you know, I mean, the whole thing goes to shit. No, whether it's like the boom pole operator or like a, a PA, like you need everyone on point. Um, but in band, like especially growing up in bands. Um, you know, like generally speaking, I've never had good luck. Uh, I've had good luck with band members that are talented musicians, but I have not had good luck in finding really motivated people to play with. Um, so it would always be like, I would be the driving force. And I would also like, I also like to, to my own demise, like I would be over ambitious, you know, so my ambition would get the best of me and I would push more than people would want to be pushed or more than they should be pushed. Um, so, and I feel like there's that thing with Judy where like, I, I actually like have such an affection for that character in that, like, like one thing I, I constantly kept like wrestling with during the writing process is I didn't want her to just be kind of like a, a pushy kind of like type a personality. Like I wanted her to be, I wanted her to be able to have fun with them. I wanted her to, to be like a, a strong character. It also was kind of like show that thing in that, like in these types of like, artistic endeavors like there is kind of like uh, as far as my experience there's this one person who's kind of like the driving force and oftentimes they they push way too hard sometimes and you know i, I think i might have said this in, in in that interview that we were kind of a part of is like you know you sell your soul yeah. um like you it's it's not when i reflect on it there's some things that i you know i did or i said or i pushed on that i was like yeah i, I was the dick in that situation you know um like they, like I might have had a lazy band member, but they didn't deserve to catch so much shit, you know. I've been in that position, and I have too. So yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of because the music is is you know very good, especially from a you know from myself who's a punk rock fan. Yeah, kind of how that whole process went. If because I know you were saying that um, he wrote the music and. Did you kind of collaborate with it, or? Yeah, I would. I would say like ninety ninety nine percent of it is Jeff. Like the yeah. like the only two things that I had any part of is I wrote the lyrics for Dominion Rising, which is kind of the antag the antagonist band. Okay. Yeah. Like I wrote the I wrote the lyrics to Jeff's music, um, and I was like like Ryan ended up actually replacing my voice with his, but I sang on that track because I yeah. I love to make fun of those like haircut bands. Yeah. Um, but then, uh, besides that, the only direction I gave Jeff with the music is that I wanted it to be joyful and nihilistic. I mean, like, Jeff's, the, the music Jeff writes, especially the, the punk stuff he writes, um, has that type of, that type of joyful nihilism. It has, like, it's super melodic and catchy, but it has, like, a, like a bit of, like, a, it has, it's a bit, there's a bit of grime to it. Yeah. Um, not in the traditional sense. Um, so that's like, that's just Jeff, like, Jeff is just, like, an insanely talented, uh, musician that, like, you know, gets a little, like, one or two, like, adjectives or descriptive ways in which you want the music to sound. And then, like, he wrote, like, a seven-song EP um, that was just incredible. And I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention also uh, Augusta Koch, who was in Kaitana, and now she's in the band Gladdy. Um, she provided the vocals for Judy, and she's, like, an amazing uh, musician uh, and vocalist. And Bill Orinder, who did drums for... Uh, for the the music of the film that basically Mel plays to that drum beat. Um, they're both like amazing musicians that, that really kind of like uh, helped us out in like a really kind of tough time of trying to get the music like, like done be before we were set to produce the, uh, 
the the movie. Are you going to be releasing uh, the soundtrack? Oh man, <laughs> yeah. I mean that that that's the dream. So okay. Jeff Jeff is in the band. Jeff is in a band right now with Bill, who played drums uh, called Five Hundred Bucks, and they re-recorded um, a couple of the songs from the movie in like a really like like one of the the big studios that you can kind of record rock music in. I forget what it's called because that's kind of like I'm not in that world anymore. Yeah. Um, but they recorded two of those songs, but we're kind of like holding off hoping that if the movie uh if people really respond to the movie in the way that we hope that hopefully you know whether it's mondo or waxwork records or any any uh label if they want to release a uh a dust seven inch or a ep or a vinyl um of any sort or or demo tape we are happy to uh to accommodate we really want to get that music out that's great and i definitely get it (laughs) But um, I am going to backtrack a little bit. And since we talked all, a ton about the music, about what made you switch, decide to do it as a horror movie and add the demon. Yeah. So, like, I, I've always loved horror. I mean, I was, uh, you know, the kid that the mom would take him to the video store for, like, the two old rentals for the price of one. And I would immediately go to the horror movie section. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I grew up on horror movies. I've, I've, I've made like a few horror movies. I produced a bunch and, uh, I like really like around the time I was like trying to really pitch, uh, you know, the uncle Peckerhead adult swim idea. I had, um, I had gone to, uh, I, I won't name the festival, but I went to a horror film festival with a film I had produced called uh, Holiday Fear. And like a lot of the feature films I saw, and this is no, this is no, no offense to them, but a lot of the films I saw were kind of very similar in terms of like their approach, in terms of the tone, in terms of the basic feel. And I felt that there was like, especially at a film festival, I'm looking for, uh, the type of film that I hope Peckerhead is, which is just like a blast to watch with people. You know, you have like a couple beers, you like, you, you can like cringe or shout or laugh at the screen. Like people are really kind of like communicating like as a, as a kind of a collective, you know, while they watch the movie. Yeah. Um, and it, re- it really wasn't a film that I had discovered at the festival that was like fun, you know, that I would say like, wow, that was a fucking blast watching that. I'm so glad I saw that with an audience. Um, and I was like, man, and like if you can see that the audience was hungry for for a film like that, um, but there just wasn't one at this festival. So it was just kind of like like you know you're with your friends. Uh, it was with my wife, and we were kind of like having like a late night thing where you're kind of getting drunk, and you're like, man, we should like do this. We should make that movie. Um, and that's kind of where it, it kind of came from. Like like literally the next week, I started writing uh, for. I started writing what initially became the first draft of Peck Press. Okay. So what was the, how long did it take to get that first draft done in the whole um, screenwriting process? Oh man, it was, it was actually like a pretty quick process. Like I would say, uh, man, when did I start the first draft? I mean, I probably started the first draft in like the early summer at some point. And then by like, you know, by early, I'd say like late October, early November, we were like, we're going to do it. Oh. Um, and this is like in like 2017. And then by June of 2018, we shot for 18 days. Okay. Um, yeah. So it was like, it was a pretty, I would say like, like from the initial seedling of the idea to uh, pro- like, like straight up producing the movie, it was just a year and a half. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah, it was a really, it was a quick, it was a quick kind of writing process and just like, and it was also that thing that like a lot of the people that worked on it were at like a good point in their life. Like nobody was having kids. Um, like, you know, like everyone was kind of like just before they were about to make a, a huge commitment with either a job or, you know, family or a wedding. So it's basically like you kind of find, like I found those like seven or eight friends um, who were kind of the, the big contributors to the film, like, like each and every day. And they were all in the right place at the right time. And they're like, let's just do it. Let's get it. Let's try and make this happen. Wow. That's, that's yeah. That's incredible. And so I know because it's, you know, obviously like almost become now when you talk about film, the elephant in the room, what has it been like? 
I guess in terms of you know dealing with the this pandemic of like has it really yeah. kind of thrown a wrench in things and or has it like, maybe helped in a way or yeah yeah I mean it's so it's like it's so t- like and, and it's I, I think it's a, it's a great question to ask and it's like it's so tough to kind of reflect on because there's like you know you're looking at it two ways yeah in that, like, you know, from a personal point of view or the film's point of view, uh, we played Panic Fest in January in Kansas City, and it was, like, it was our premiere, and it was such a great experience. The people, the guys that run it are, like, total, total, like, 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 amazing, totally amazing people. Really, really great. The audience was great. We, we, we got a bunch of support. A lot of people were kind of, like, like just showering us in in praise i don't think we deserve but it was it was such a great feeling and it kind of we were on such a high and we were set to kind of have a really nice festival run after that and then obviously uh you know covid happened so you know i mean in short you know selfishly it it fucking sucked it's awful yeah. you know like it, it like i i love going to festivals i love meeting people i love meeting filmmakers i love watching films i love going to the theater i mean i'm like an alamo draft house pass member yeah. i like I, I i belong to the film forum like i go, i go to the movies like two or three times a week um and it just i mean it just sucks across the board i mean but there is that other thing that you know people are in such in such a bad way um and i feel like incredibly lucky that you know th- like my friends and family for the most part are safe and healthy yeah. you know and like and we finish the movie and the movie's finding its audience maybe in a in wildly different way than we thought at first you know we could have never expected but you're just kind of like you know in the real sense of being like a human being like there's so much you know t- there's so much kind of terrible shit going on in the world that i'm just happy that like like we were able to finish the movie we're able to share it with people and that like the people in my life are safe and happy and you know hopefully things will start to kind of get better from there uh, but yeah it's, it's a wild fucking time uh, yeah, as, as, as everyone knows um it's just like a total it, it totally threw a wrench in the works in in more ways than one but i should say that like Epic Pictures, or, I, or rather Dread Presents, which is under Epic yeah. Pictures, um, was so great in, in helping us uh, to kind of pivot. And they've been so supportive in helping to kind of distribute the film, get it out there. And they, they've really believed in the film uh, since like we met them at Panic Fest, which was our premiere. So even before all this happened, they were kind of champions for our film and kind of, uh, you know, what we wanted to do. So they've been like the best partners uh, somebody could ask for. So I know you're doing this movie right now, but how, what's on the horizon and um, how can people find you if they want to, like on social media or anything like that? Totally. Um, so I would say like the best place where you can kind of read, because we have a couple of pages set up to talk about our future projects is our production hub, which is subtletrex.com. And that, that'll give you like all the social media handles you want for like my personal stuff, uh, Uncle Peckerhead's social media. I mean, Uncle Peckerhead's just Uncle Peckerhead on Instagram, Uncle Peckerhead on Twitter, Uncle Peckerhead on Facebook. But subtletrex.com, there's no dashes, there's no spaces, there's no whatever it is. Um, that's the best place to kind of read about projects, kind of read about the movie, see a trailer for the movie if you haven't seen it yet find out where you can watch or, or buy or rent the movie. All of that stuff is probably the best place. And, and also that talks about like the Larry Gunn Demon uh, feature that, that we're hoping to make, which is kind of in the Uncle Peckerhead universe. Okay. It talks about a bunch of other projects that, uh, that we're hoping to get off the ground. Sounds yeah, incredible. And as I said before, it was great to be able to watch it and to be able to. Oh man, this was a great interview. Thanks so much for sitting down and talking with me and loving on the movie. This was, uh, this was great. Of course. And yeah, anytime you want to come back. (laughs) Yeah. Happy to come back. Yeah. All right. Take it easy. You too. Bloodhound picks podcast is produced by Josh Lee, Craig Dram and Kyle Hintz. Music by Raymond seed audio editing by Kyle Hintz.